These singers call themselves Brothers of Peace. They perform in the Lutheran Church of Katatura, a suburb of the Namibian capital Windhoek. The parish was founded by German missionaries in the 19th century. Later, in the apartheid era, Katatura would become notorious as the dumping ground of forced removals to make way for white suburbs. Namibians have tried to adapt into that, into that context of uh, yeah, a heavy load from missionary work. Yeah, and they have been trying also to, to critique, to critique and to, especially in the, in the area of theologians, they have tried to critique and uh, come up with their own uh, understanding of who God is, their own understanding of uh, yeah, grace in their own context, even salvation in their own context. The theological college where Professor Undemaweda teaches was also founded by German missionaries. The Paulinum, as it's called, prepares men and women for ministry in the Namibian church. Undemaweda is a progressive theologian. This term he is offering a course entitled the destruction of the environment by commercial greed. Five hundred years after Martin Luther nailed his famous theses to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church, Professor Undemawerde is demanding an eco-reformation. Extensively using them, extensively using them for 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 for. He argues that we are overtaxing the environment in our insatiable greed for profit. He views this capitalist obsession as the most crucial issue for Christians in Africa. He's also opposed to a literal interpretation of the Bible. We have many who are still thinking in, in terms of uh, the colonial theology. Yeah, because uh, um, they are not critical. They, we have we have many congregants, congregation members who are not criti thinking critical, reading their Bible critical. But at our theological level, yeah, it's different. Where we we, we, we we think that even the Bible itself has this intrinsic uh, uh, imperialistic uh, um, feature or in itself, where it can be racist, where it can be understood as also imperialistic and so on, and we, we, that, that's what we do at the theological level. Luther's African heirs, like Professor Ndemawerda, are developing an assertive African theology. But there is also a white Lutheran community in Namibia with a strong attachment to its German identity. Its landmark church is the Christuskirche in downtown Windhoek. In the early 1880s, a German merchant called Adolf Luderitz landed on the southwest shores of Africa. He traded with the nomadic people he encountered here and persuaded them to give him land. The German Kaiser eventually appropriated that land, proclaiming it a so-called German protectorate. German missionaries had already ventured into the territory from South Africa. They established a mission station near present-day Windhoek in 1844 and called it Barmen, after the town in Germany where the Rhenish Missionary Society was based. Josef Chinae explains this history to his three sons on their annual pilgrimage to Okahandia. <laughs> He tells them about missionaries with foreign-sounding names like Kleinschmidt and Hugo Hahn. In August each year, Josef Chinae and his sons hike to Akahanja, 60 kilometers north of Windhoek, to attend a gathering of their people. 
The Herero experience of German settlers, soldiers and missionaries is a complex, often painful story. The Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885, also known as the Congo Conference, was a land grab. It divided Africa among the rival European powers. Imperial Germany won the territory that became known as German Southwest Africa, present-day Namibia. From then on, colonial officials in Berlin, like Paul Rohrbach, saw to it that German settlers and traders could conduct their business in Africa without interference. Josef Echenae tells his sons how the Germans stole their ancestors' cattle and then their land. They gave them a bit of money, he says, and a lot of liquor. The missionaries told their converts they must obey the German Kaiser. He was a Lutheran like them, they said, and God had appointed him their ruler. German businessmen were eager to get their hands on the country's rich mineral resources, gold, copper and diamonds. The mining companies divided up the territory among themselves. The Kaiser sent a contingent of several hundred troops to German Southwest Africa. The purpose of this so-called protection force was to guarantee the safety of the German settlers, traders and miners, but also the missionaries. Traces of the German presence are still visible all over Namibia. The Germans built the railway for economic and military purposes. The landmark Christus Kirche now stands in the shadow of the grandiose National Museum of Namibia. The museum used to be housed in the old fort, the headquarters of the former protection force. Here you can see a once famous equestrian monument, the Rider of the Southwest, now relegated to a back courtyard. The Lutheran church in Namibia is still struggling to come to terms with its colonial heritage. Unfortunately, our brothers and sisters from Germany created two churches, one white, white, white Lutheran and one black. Yeah, we are now struggling with those, uh, with those uh, divisions, which were not our own making. Yeah, they, they were made somewhere else and we be, we have, they have become our problem now. Integration is still a challenge for Namibian society, in the schools as well as in churches. The local Lutheran churches have a lot of political clout. Almost 90% of the population is Christian, and about half of those are Lutheran. This workshop is taking place in a Christian guest house in Windhoek. Young people from Namibia, Botswana and Germany, all from Lutheran parishes, are rehearsing a musical. The songs and script portray the various issues they each deal with in their lives. It's called Live My Life. These are the great-grandchildren of those early missionaries and of the Africans who used to be called mission children. The other kids are focusing on the problems of everyday life in the other two African countries, problems we don't really know about. When you first hear about them, you think, oh, but it's part of their everyday life, so they're tackling them. It's also their focus when we say, just describe your life in Africa. If you could change it, what would we see? This is life in a former township. Lunch at a fast food restaurant is considered a luxury here. A hundred years after Germany lost its colonies, visitors from Europe still encounter poverty. I totally reject the idea that we Germans still carry a burden of guilt. 
Because I'm 20, it has nothing to do with me. But I'm wondering if we'll be confronted with that. Whether there are grudges. I'm wondering. But I really hope it's not the case. We are referring to the reconciliation between the Germans and the Herero after the 1904 genocide that was done. And, uh, so the, 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 the group wants to talk about reconciliation. Josef Anchinaye relates this particularly brutal chapter in the history of Germany's involvement with Namibia to his sons. In the colony known as German Southwest Africa, tensions boiled over towards the end of the 19th century. The Germans behaved towards the natives increasingly like white supremacists and were supported by the church. The missionaries thought they had turned the Herero, who they converted to Christianity, into loyal subjects of the Kaiser. St. Paul says we must obey the authorities that have power over us, in this case, the Kaiser and his deputies. That was what the missionaries preached to the Herero. The colonial administrator at the turn of the century was Theodor Leutwein. With military toughness, he tried to force an agreement on the Herero and others, the Nama and Damara. Germany would continue to draw the major profits from the mines, but the native peoples would receive a small percentage. The missionaries supported Leutwein. However, the Herero were led at this time by an intelligent and assertive chief called Samuel Maherero. At first, he tried to cooperate with the German authorities. He even wore a German uniform and the typical hat of the protection force. But Maherero soon realized that the colonialists were exploiting his people. They bought cattle from the Herero for a song and then demanded land to graze them, land that belonged to his people. Samuel Maherero appealed to the missionaries for justice. They responded by accusing him of rebelling against his Kaiser. The Germans came and told the Herero they had to become Christians. They built a church in Okahanya. They also established a school and taught the Herero to read. That was good. But then the Germans started to oppress the Herero. We saw that they were not honest. First they said become Christians, and then they attacked us. In January 1904, rumors began to spread that the Herero were gathering in large numbers, angry and armed. Most of the colonists sought refuge in the protection force garrisons. But the trader Adolf Diekmann procrastinated. He was caught by the rebels and shot dead in Okahandia, together with his wife and six-month-old baby. This incident sparked outrage among the white colonists. With the killing of the Diekmanns, the conflict escalated into war. The local Lutheran missionary, August Diel, viewed Samuel Maherero as a friend. He spoke Herero fluently and on several occasions had acted as an intermediary between the paramount chief and Governor Leutwein. But the incident in Okahandia turned Diel against his Herero friend. He accused the chief of being responsible for the murders. In a letter to the governor, he raised the possibility of war and said Samuel Maherero must accept his fate from the hands of God. He, Diel, would do nothing to help him. Theodor Leutwein tried to contain the conflict. He thought some limited punitive action by the protection force would be sufficient to put down the revolt and placate the colonists. But the Kaiser took a different view. Wilhelm II considered Leutwein ineffective. Within a few weeks, thousands of reinforcements from Berlin were dispatched to the rebellious colony. Leutwein was replaced as governor. 
Lieutenant General Lothar von Trotha, who had already earned himself an infamous reputation as the Butcher of East Africa, was put in charge and given command of military operations. Then the horror began. The missionaries called our people to the church and said, let us pray. Then, as the people prayed, German soldiers came and fired into the church and killed many people. That may be just a legend, but there's no doubt that von Trotha's methods were brutal. The Herero were nomadic herdsmen. The German general trained artillery on their camps. The protection force was ratcheted up to more than 8,000 men. The opposing force was no more than five or 6,000 lightly armed herdsmen. Our ancestors tried to resist the Germans, but they only had rifles and sticks. They fought, but they weren't armed like the Germans. However, the Herero had one significant advantage. They knew the land. Using guerrilla tactics, they managed to kill some 200 German soldiers in the first three months of the war. Then General von Trotha made his notorious decisive move. With artillery and machine guns, he drove the Herero onto a strip of land at the foot of the Waterberg mountain, 40,000 of them, men, women and children. Then the Germans attacked on three sides. The only hope for the Herero was to flee across the arid Omaheka plateau. Those who tried to emerge from the desert were shot by German patrols along the perimeter of the Omaheka. Thousands of Herero died of hunger and dehydration. It was the first planned genocide of the 20th century. Obviously, through the order of General von Trotter that every Herero man, woman and child uh, must be killed and those who want to survive must flee the land. Um, and so the end result was that 80% of our people were actually, um, you know, massacred. They were killed. By the end of 1904, more than 60,000 Herero had been murdered. Fewer than 20,000 survived, and they were only spared because a group of Christian missionaries demanded an end to the killing. The survivors were interned in concentration camps. That was the official designation of the prisons where they were held virtually as slaves. The genocide that was committed over 111 years ago has left some very deep scars, uh, emotionally, psychologically, uh, physically, and otherwise, on the Ovaherero people. Uh, the, um, we were deprived of our means of livelihood. Uh, the land, which is the very basis of our livelihood, uh, our cattle in the hundreds of thousands were confiscated. Uh, we, our very means of livelihood uh, were taken away. At the end of their three-day journey, Josef Chinaye and his sons have arrived in Okahandia for the annual gathering known as Herero Day. The event commemorates the Herero chiefs, and in particular Samuel Maharero, who resisted the German occupation. A chief greets them with the traditional blessing. The commemoration lasts three days. The men wear military-style fantasy uniforms, in the German manner, as they say, and the women wear the traditional dress of the Herero. It's an occasion of national pride, but also overshadowed by colonial history. Our people until today feel these effects of uh, total poverty and deprivation. We have lost our ancestral lands. Uh, we live in poverty. And these effects are with us on a daily basis. Oh, 
The suffering of the Namibian people didn't end with the collapse of the colonial power. At the conclusion of the First World War, the League of Nations transferred the so-called Southwest African Protectorate to South Africa. The government in Pretoria stretched the tentacles of apartheid over its western neighbor. It wasn't until 1990 that Namibia achieved independence. That independence was preceded by a long war of attrition with alleged atrocities on both sides. On a hill outside Windhoek stands a memorial to the country's freedom fighters. This is also where Samuel Maherero is now buried, the Herero leader who defied the Germans. To, to have a little but not much is why you see today everywhere in Windhoek even we honor them. Pastor Lorenz Kuzachike is showing Hero's Acre to this international group of Christians. He explains that the monument is intended to honor all of Namibia's heroes, those who, like Samuel Maherero, resisted the German colonial force and those who fought against the forces of apartheid. They are all Namibian heroes. We are commemorating and remembering also the, 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 the fallen heroes of Namibia. Yeah. Like Cuba and the Soviet Union so supported the liberation struggle and Namibia's Heroes Acre is very much in the communist style. There's no commemoration of the German settlers here. History has labeled them oppressors. Heroes Acre in Windsor is a place where my heroes that fought the liberation struggle are buried. So I feel very proud when I'm here, yes. And I feel very good that, that now Namibia is a better place for living, for, for all of us that are living in Namibia. So for me personally, it's, I'm very proud of this place actually, yeah. I would just say that. Namibia is one of the main beneficiaries of German development aid. But the Herero also want reparation for the suffering inflicted on their people in the genocide perpetrated by German troops in 1904. We expect that uh, just like Germany has done with other people in similar circumstances, our people are also equally entitled to reparations to effect social justice to what has happened. And not in a symbolic way, but in a meaningful way because that's the only way that we can heal the wounds of the past and effect, uh, actually create the basis for meaningful reconciliation between our two peoples and our two countries. Rush hour in Katatura. This former township is hardly any different from other suburbs of Windhoek. It has supermarkets, tarmac roads and masses of cars. But one aspect hasn't changed since the apartheid era. No whites live in Katatura. The Lutheran Macedonian Church is an entirely black parish. The music group comprising singers from Namibia, Botswana and Germany is performing in the church this evening. They've been rehearsing together for a week and found a common rhythm. The young Germans will return home with the impression that black Namibians don't feel any animosity towards Germans, in spite of their colonial history. From Namibia, they traveled to Berlin, where this year, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation is being celebrated at the Evangelical Church Convention. Here, prominent Lutherans are discussing whether the Reformation benefited distant countries, like those in Africa, and whether the church today bears a responsibility for the mistakes of the past. 
The Evangelical Church in Germany has explicitly acknowledged its guilt with regard to the genocide in Namibia. Now it must bear fruit. It must have political consequences. Germany has to do some more work on this issue. But I don't have a bad conscience about the fact that Lutherans and other Protestants brought the gospel to southern Africa. The question of reparation payments, specifically for the genocide committed more than a hundred years ago, will no doubt occupy the politicians for a long time. But earlier this year, the German Lutheran Church officially admitted that its missionaries in southwest Africa didn't do enough to oppose the war of extermination in the former colony. Further, it acknowledged that many churchmen were imperialistic and racist. And the Lutherans in Namibia have accepted this apology in a step towards reconciliation. Oh, yeah.